Violets is the newest novel in translation by Korean author Kyung Suk Shin. I love the works of Kyung Suk Shin. I haven't read everything that she's put out, but I've read a lot of it, and every single book of hers is a masterpiece in one way or another, and Violets is no exception. At the time of recording, this is a brand new novel, and it is translated by Anton He. Anton He is on a winning streak at the moment. He translated two novels from Korean to English in 2021 that made the international book a long list, and one of those two books has just made the short list, Cursed Bunny by Bora Chung, and I am thrilled for Anton. I'm thrilled for myself as a massive fan of Cursed Bunny. And now we have this Kyung Suk Shin novel also translated by Anton, so he's on a win, and we're on a win too because we get to read more translations by Anton He and a new Kyung Suk Shin novel. Violets is a tonally unique novel, at least from my perspective. I've read a lot of Korean novels over the years that have a sense of surrealism to them that is not intensely surreal, to the point that the novel makes no sense, but there is an element of surrealism in them that helps to carry the tone and the weight and the themes of the book. Two great examples of this are Untold Night and Day by Bae Suwa and Be Book and Me by Kim Sagwa. Both of these authors use surrealism as a way to just channel the emotions and tone of these novels. Surrealism is not the be-all and end-all of these books, but it is a vital thematic and tonal element. And you get that here with Violets as well, but filtered down, watered down even a little more. Surrealism is here, but it's so subtle. It's sprinkled over this novel. Occasionally, throughout the book, there are elements that just feel a little off, and often it is in conversation between characters. It's almost as though the characters are talking, and they're not quite looking at each other. There will just be a conversation between two characters, where they're talking about the same thing, they're on the same page, but it's almost like their words are just overlapping. This is what I was picturing as I was reading it. Almost as if they weren't quite connecting the way that they were supposed to. And I thought that this just added a slightly magical element to the book. And it's something that could completely go unnoticed, and I might even be reading into it wrong, if you can. But that's how it felt to me. And I just found that magnificent, and you see it right at the beginning in the first chapter, which sort of acts as a prologue to the rest of the book. The blurb of this book sums up the prologue, so I'm going to tell you what happens in the prologue, and then a little bit more of the book without spoiling what it goes into. The book begins in 1970. Our protagonist is a young girl called San who lives in a small village. San has befriended a girl her age, and the two of them are getting very, very close. This girl is called Namae, and one of the quirks of her family is that her father often gets drunk and climbs into an enormous oversized pot in the garden, and he sits in this empty pot and sings while he's drunk. And the image of this I just found delightful. San and Namae have connected in spite of a lot of personal difficulties. San is not a happy child, and she has been sort of ostracized in more ways than one. But at the culmination of this prologue chapter, San and Namae are out in a Minari field, and they have a moment of intimacy that ends in a kiss. San feels her entire body electrify. She feels alive, she feels connected to Namae. She feels so much in that moment, and the way it's described is the purest, most blissful description. Namae, on the other hand, retracts, runs home, is ashamed, she heckles San, and she refuses to see her again. And that's it, that's the end of their relationship. And San is left feeling broken and hollow after this incredible moment that has changed her life and her emotional state forever. Then we fast forward to San at 23 years old, and she's living in Seoul. She's got her eyes set on working as a copywriter at a publishing house. After having worked at a hair salon for two years, and there's a wonderful moment where she describes the fact that the hair from the salon has wormed its way into her entire existence. There's a moment where she wakes up in the middle of the night with a pain in her eyeball, and it's a tiny piece of someone else's hair from the salon. And it's almost a body horror, B-movie monster thing 
for a second the way that the hair from the salon is just crawling into her life. And it's really just a flashback. It's a half page long moment where she's looking back on what the salon did to her, but it feels like a Junji Ito short story. But San doesn't end up working as a copywriter. She ends up as a florist. She takes this job at a flower shop in Seoul, a flower shop that's kind of open and spilling out onto the street. And very quickly, very early on, she meets a girl who works at this flower shop and the two of them move in together. And the book is mostly about San confronting her past, confronting her mother, confronting her history, but it's also about the relationship between these two girls. And it's also about men, but we'll come to that. The girl is called Sue and the two of them are about the same age, and they're very different in terms of personality. Sue is a little bit more colorful in her personality. Extroverted, maybe, compared to San's more introverted attitude to life. And the two of them have slowly built a connection over time, and there are a lot of chapters that really just focus on the flower shop, they focus on the farm where the flowers come from, and the two of them often go to this farm. It's a tumultuous story, and these moments where everything just calms down and you enjoy the flower shop and the farm, these are really precious moments and I really, really appreciated them. They feel like a pit stop. They feel like a moment where you can collect yourself because there are so many things in this book that are difficult. Just as I said, the prologue chapter is very hard hitting and powerful. The fact that San is getting letters from her mother who is dying and San is just ignoring them. She cannot face her mother even as her mother dies. I'm not gonna tell you anything about the second half of the novel, and I haven't really told you anything that isn't established very early on, but I do want to talk thematically about men. On the blurb, there is a quote from Charlene Toe, author of Ponty, which I actually wrote a review of like years ago. I'll link it below in case you wanna read it. Charlene Toe said that this book is mesmerizing, dreamlike, and prescient in its sharpness and attentiveness to the dynamics between women and the male and female gaze. And this pretty much sums up Violet's thematically and perfectly. I barely speak a word of Korean, but I can read Hangul. It's something that I learned before I moved there. And honestly, if you haven't learned Hangul, it takes like an hour. <laughs> this says Violet's, but I was just looking at it one day while I was thinking about something and I noticed as I read it, and I read it out slowly to myself, that it could be read as violate. And then there's a moment in the book, and this is kind of a thematic spoiler, but not a narrative one, where San pulls out an English to Korean dictionary and looks at the word violets because the flower, the violet, is a recurring motif in this book. And she's looking at the word violet in the dictionary and underneath you get the definition for violence and underneath that, the definition for violate. And I was like, huh, I noticed that, pat on the back for me. But that links back to what Charlene Toe was saying. This is a book about the way that women look at women the way that women have relationships with women, and it compares that to the way that men look at women. San and her friend in chapter one have the most intimate, beautiful, romantic moment that I've read in literature in years. It took my breath away. These two young girls exploring their intimacy with one another. And obviously it doesn't go well, but for San, personally, privately, this is a very important moment for her. And then her relationship with Sue, as the book goes on, is intimate in a lot of different ways. Mostly, predominantly, it is a very important friendship that is growing between these two girls. Again, very intimate. They care for each other, they look after each other, they bond in so many different intimate, clever, minute ways. But throughout this book, men exist, and these men are looking at San and they are touching her. And this book so brilliantly explores the way that men violate women in the quiet and subtle ways that we never talk about. I've been in London a lot recently and whenever I'm on the tube, I see posters on the platforms or on the escalators that remind men that staring at women is sexual abuse. And I think this is a really fantastic bit of awareness. And this book really highlights that as well. There are so many ways that men violate women that we don't talk about. The violation of a woman's space. I was talking to a friend of mine about this and the way that say you're in a narrow space 
and you're a woman, say you're on a train carriage and you're in the aisle and a man wants to squeeze by and he will put his hand on your lower back as he moves by. It's just a thing men do and we all often accept it. But this is violation. This is a violation of a woman's space, of her body, of her autonomy. And Violets goes into this. It goes into this in a brilliant way. There's a moment where San has goosebumps. For some reason, maybe she's cold, she has goosebumps on her arm and a man brushes his fingers across the goosebumps and it just sent me spiraling, and it does to her too. This moment sticks in her head, it comes up again and again and again. The way that men subtly and quietly, invisibly violate women. And conversely, this is a celebration of the love and the friendship and the beauty of the bonds between women. I was so taken by that difference. When San reads that dictionary definition, it talks about how violets can be almost a derogatory description for women or anyone who is kind of meek, a shrinking violet. The idea that women are shrinking violets and men violate. It's very clever. And it hit me so hard I wanted to cry multiple times. I cry for the social power dynamics between men and women, and I was crying tears of joy at the intimate connections between San and the women in her life. This is a book of parallels, the way that women respect one another, and men don't have a clue how to respect women. By the way, as my YouTube channel grows, I get more and more horrible men leaving comments, and if you're a man who's watching this and kind of getting upset and feeling like I'm targeting you in some way, I'm not. If you're one of the good guys, you don't get upset by the things I'm saying. That's the thing. It's only ever the men who do wrong things that get so offended by this. Good men know that men as a whole are bad, and they accept that, and they smile, and they don't mind, and they do their best to be the good ones. I'm just gonna leave that in there. This book hit me so hard multiple times. It's very, very narratively simple, but it has so many motifs and themes and character dynamics and relationships that hit me so hard again and again and again. And I, I'm so grateful to Kyung Suk Shin and Anton He for creating this and for providing me with such a moving narrative and such wonderful characters and for having me respect the beautiful bonds between people and get angry at the connections that are so sour and toxic. This is a great book. This is a wonderful piece of Korean fiction. Kyung Suk Shin is amazing. Anton Ho is wonderful. Thank you to both of them. Subscribe for books.